Welcome to Elevate Your Approval Processes. Uh, start out by, I think the, the sponsor slide changed at some point and I didn't catch up. But yeah, I really appreciate the sponsors for bringing us out here, um, making this all possible. Um, I work for one of the sponsors, Kalamuna. My name is Bob McDonald and I'm a senior Drupal architect there at Kalamuna. UltraBob on Drupal.org. Um, I'm originally from Idaho, but I spent about 24 years in Japan before I moved to Canada to join Kalamuna uh, April of last year. And I've been pointed out that this is the last session, so I guess the, I'm the headliner now, so this is now Bob Camp. <laughs> <laughs> I love making stuff um, that extends to both physical and digital things and includes approval systems in Drupal, which I've made several of and I've gotten fairly good at it over the years. I really care a lot about making sure that the systems I build are empathetic and consider the user first. So I'm going to try and inject some of that into the talk today. Um, so yeah, what are we going to talk about? I'd like to just make sure that everyone's on the same page by spending a few minutes talking about what workflows look like in core. And then we'll start talking about how we can push beyond that um, by going through several systems that I've built over the years and what I've kind of identified as the keys to success out of those experiences. Um, then I'll talk about what you should be thinking about when you're planning a system like this. We'll take a look at some useful tools, some code samples, do Q&A, and get, get everybody on their way home. So let's take a look at workflows in core. Uh, workflows in core consists of two modules. There's the workflows module, which really sets up the framework for modules. It sets up states, transitions, default states, and it introduces a workflow type plugin manager. Without that work, workflow type plugin, workflows doesn't actually do anything in Drupal. It needs that plugin to connect it with the content. And there are several workflow type plugins available in the contrib space. And I realize this room's really echoey, so if I'm projecting too much, let me know and I'll, I'll back it up. But uh, the one that comes with core is called content moderation. And that's the one we're going to talk about today. That's what we've used for a lot of these projects, but there are other options out there. Um, and content moderation links your workflow with your revisionable content entities and controls whether they're public or not. And it's out of the box, it's intended for building editorial type workflows. So that's what we'll look at while we're going through the example here. So let's look at that example. And we're, we're now looking at five states. State is the really basic concept of workflows. A state is the logical stage that your content can be in as it progresses through its life cycle on your site. We've got five here, we've got draft, awaiting editorial review, pending publication, published, and archived. And you probably notice that each one of those states has two settings on it. Whether a revision saved into that state is considered published or not, and whether a revision saved into that state becomes the default revision or not. Now speaking of saving revisions into states, that's where transitions come in. And transitions are the ways that your content moves from state to state. So let's enable a few of those so we can take a look at how content moves through a workflow. So I've enabled three here, and you've probably noticed they're all three different colors. That brings me to the first of four things that I want to make sure everyone understands about transitions. And that's that each transition has a permission, so they can be assigned different roles. So out of the box, content moderation lets you control who can use an action based on what role they have. Uh, for systems I've built, usually that hasn't been enough, and so we need to edit, kind of alter those access permissions, and, and what comes out of content moderation doesn't work exactly for us, but that's what you get out of the box. Um, and you can see here we've got three transitions. We have submit to editor, which can be used by the author. We have publish, which can be used by the editor. And then we have keep an editorial approval, which can be used by both. So let's follow a piece of content through the, through the system. Author comes along, creates a draft, and submits it to the editor. 
And then the author and the editor might spend a few rounds of revisioning to try and get the thing ready for publication. And that's where keep an editorial approval comes in. Um, and that's the second of four things that I want to make sure everyone understands. That you need to transition for every path between the states. And that includes saving into the same state. So if we didn't have transition B here, once we submitted to the editor, the only op option we'd have, given the transitions that we're seeing here, would be to publish it if we made another change. So let's, let's do that. The editor and the author get it to the point where they feel like it's ready to go, so the editor uses the published transition to publish it. But you probably notice that published looks more complicated than the other ones. And that leads into the last two things that I want everyone to understand. And that's that you can have multiple froms in a transition, but only one to. You see here we've got four froms on publish. It can come from draft, awaiting editorial review, pending publication or published, and they're all going to published. And the second thing is that each of those from two pairs has to be unique. So given that publish includes from draft to published, we couldn't create another transition called quick publish that, which also goes from draft to published because that's already covered by the published transition. So that's really the basics I want everyone to understand about content moderation. Here's a gl glimpse of an, what a completed workflow might look like. I'm not gonna dwell on it, but I've got the QR code where you can get the slides at both the beginning and the end if you wanna spend some time looking at it. Feel free. Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, I'm an editor, I um, create a new content and put it in draft, and uh, I submit it for like, I keep it in draft. Okay, so the other publisher becomes reviews there. Uh, so he will either like, send it back to me or he will publish, right? So the one which you're saying that is going to be a new state, uh, keep an editor will approve me. I'm not sure I follow the question. So what I was going to say is like, so suppose if I'm editor, I create a new content and put it in draft, okay? Uh -huh. And you're the publisher. So you come review the content. So you either publish it or you send it back to me uh, to modify, right? So no, not in this workflow. Okay. Um, you could potentially have a workflow like that where I send it back to draft. Okay. Um, uh, I, but I, in, I, in I, this I, one, that's what this setting here does, the default revision setting. Okay. That determines whether this is the, uh, if, if you're familiar with the Drupal interface, you have the latest version tab in there when you have a new draft that's not published yet. If you're saving into one that doesn't have the default revision checked, that's what, it's gonna create a new draft, okay. basically, essentially. Yes? Uh, you can, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can create additional people and, yes. and give them custom permissions to be like super publisher. He's, he, that role is the only one that can actually publish, or the only one that can actually archive something. Yes, so you, however many roles you have on your site, each transition, this is the out of the box behavior, each transition has its own permission, and so you can assign those appropriately for whatever roles you have. Uh, are we good to move on to examples? Okay. All right, um, so we'll talk through a few projects that I've worked on over the years and what I've learned through those. Um, and the first one was at IGES, the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, a climate change research institute that I worked, on, worked at in Japan. Um, and when I first joined them, they had an academic publishing database that was written in Zoops. It was getting really old and hard to maintain and they wanted it migrated to Drupal 7. So we migrated that to Drupal 7, um, but that's not really relevant to this talk, it's just the history, because a couple of years down the line they, they decided that they liked Drupal, they wanted their whole website done in Drupal, um, and Drupal 8 had just come out, so we migrated the publication database to Drupal 8 and built the rest of their website out on Drupal 8, and the part of that project that's relevant to this talk is that they had a long-standing publication approval policy, which 
dictated what kind of reviews each different type of publication needed to go through before it could be published. And they wanted to start enforcing that with a publication approval process on the site. So we built that in Drupal 8, and workflows became part of core midway through the Drupal 8 release cycle. And it was just in time for us to start using it for that. Um, so that was my first Drupal 8 project, my first time using workflows, and I made a ton of mistakes. Hopefully you'll benefit from some of those as we, as we talk through that. Um, the next system I want to talk about was also built at IGIS. It was an internet system, and the first part that we built on that was what they call their mission request system. And it's kind of a business travel approval system. So a researcher can go in and they can create an itinerary saying this person will be in France on these days and then in Italy on these other days, and this person will only be on the Italy leg of the trip. And then they also go in and specify which funds will be used to pay for that travel. And so that's a two-step approval system. We've got supervisor approval and funding approval. But you notice there can be more than one traveler. There can be more than one budget assigned to this. So that means it's not really just two approvals. If those two travelers have different supervisors, then you're going to have two different approvers. So at each stage, we need to do some, some further calculation because content moderation just has those states, as we saw in that diagram. Um, so we track that behind the scenes for the systems that I've used. I found the state API to be really handy for that. State API is a key value store. It's cached in Drupal core. Um, it comes with core. And it's, it's great as long as you're not going to have more than maybe 150 requests going on at the same time. Because it's cached, you can blow past that cache limit. And so if you ant anticipate having a really high volume approval system, you might need to find a different solution for that. But State API works great if you, if you don't have, expect to have that kind of volume. Um, so at each, each state we, or at each stage, we keep track of how many approvers are left on that stage, and then finally we allow the triggering to the next state, the actual transition once those have all cleared. And we keep the data about who's left to approve and what the text will be for indicating who we're waiting for and what the state is. We'll, we'll cover that a little bit later, um, why that's important. But we keep all of that in state API, so we only need to, to calculate it once when the transition changes or when a action happens and then all we need to do is pull it when, when we need to show that content somewhere. After building the mission request system, we build another system on top of that. It's called the Proposal Review and Project Database System. And that's for fundraising efforts that happen at IGIS. When, some, when a researcher is building a fundraising proposal, they circulate it to, to colleagues to get some reviews on it and make sure it's as good as it can be. And then once, once it's been reviewed and it's ready to submit to the funding agency, we ask the researcher to let us know when they expect to have a decision back from the funding agency. And then once that date rolls around, we start reminding them to come back and report on whether they were successful or not. And whether they were successful or not, we ask them, you know, why do you think you were successful or why not, as much as you know. And we store that in the proposal database and that informs future fundraising efforts can give people a head start on creating one and they can base it off of successful ones or watch out for things that made other ones unsuccessful. But if it was successful, it automatically creates an entry in the project database. And that project database um, serves a few purposes, but it's there primarily to let the management of IGES have an overview of every funded project that's happening at IGES at any given time. But when it creates that initial um, project entry, it has its own little workflow. And the first step that that goes through is the accounting team comes in and looks at the actual contract, con sorry, looks at the actual contract and updates the data in that project database entry with the details from the contract so that it's, it's realistic. And they also create budget lines in the system, and those budget lines are what are used to select who, which budgets are paying for the mission requests back in the mission request system. So it kind of went full circle in that way. 
Um, fast forward to today, we're getting we're working on the second revision of a newcomer donation system to vet donations for newcomers to Canada and match them with support agencies who can distribute them out to the newcomers who need them. Um, that's also built in Drupal 10 with workflows and the kind of differentiating factor on that system was that we did the donations as custom entity types, which allowed us to build kind of the baseline of what every donation has as an entity type that has those fields built into it. And then we can differentiate with the fields that each donation type needs in bundles. So let's talk through what all of those experiences kind of inform me are the really keys to successfully getting people to use and adopt the system. And the first thing I think you'd agree is for an approval system, things need to get approved or rejected. Decisions need to get made. Um, and, and a real key for that is letting people know when they have action to take and making sure that they can take it and they can understand what they need to do. And a key element of that are notifications. Both the on-screen notifications you can see in the screenshot at the top here, those are the ones that Drupal gives you out of the box, but you should alter those to make them useful for your approval system. So every time a user takes an action that has an impact on a request, we tell them what impact their action had on that request. We also tell them who was notified and why they were notified. And the reason we do that is to really quickly orient people with an understanding of what's going on in the system and say I made a mistake, I need to go tell somebody I made a mistake, I know who's been informed of, the, of this last stage and I can go correct it really quickly. And that leads me to the second kind of notification, those off-site notifications. Unless you're lucky enough to have your users on your site all the time, you need to let them know when there's some new action to take. And for most of the systems I built, email has suffice for that. I think Slack messages, SMS, all kinds of things would work there. Uh, but email has worked pretty well for us. This middle screenshot is an example of one of those um, off-site notifications that we sent. And this is the first of the mistakes I want to talk about. In the publication approval process uh, system, I hard-coded all my email templates into my transition code. So when, when I'm dealing with the transition, I construct that email and I send out the email. And that means that every time somebody comes along and, requ and requests a change to the template, I need to crawl through the code and figure out where that's being built and I need to fix it. And that is just not the right way to do it. It was a mistake. Um, it's also important with these, with these notifications that you can go back and remind somebody if they didn't take action based on it the first time. Maybe three days later, for example. No action has happened. You send out the same message again with a little blurb on it saying, you haven't done anything for three days and we're still waiting for your action to help make sure that people don't miss it. Um, and since I had that debacle with the publication approval process system, I found the message stack of contrib modules, which has worked really well. They give you an admin interface where you can create the email templates it supports token replacement, it's pretty easy. And then in code, all you do is associate the right node with the right token. It'll populate all the right sections of the email and send it out. Um, so for email, I think that's, that's a good way to do it. I'm sure there are other solutions as well, but that has worked well for us. And that, what we do is just leave a space in that same template. This is the same email, just one of them is a reminder, and we just leave a space to put in why you're getting this as a reminder. What was the name of the, the, the modules that you were using? Oh, it's called Message. It's, message. They, there's Message and Message Notify. There's, there's a few different um, things in the Message ecosystem of modules. Yeah. I've been working on a website for a couple of years where they have uh, emails that get sent out to various types of people and various things. And it seems like those emails are hard-coded into into the code and it's a real pain in the butt to try to deal with that. 
is message like a well-known contrib module that exists as a, has existed for a while that we could have used? It's a long, it's, it's been around for a long time. I think it's fairly well known. I think there are other options as well, but that's the one that I'm used to. Easy email. I've heard of that, and I haven't. I haven't played with that one. That's one I use. Okay, I, I will look at that. Yeah, for the Thanks. easy templates, what we do is like we created a config form where they were updating the email template very frequently. So we created a config form so they could go and update them. So and they could they are pulling the email content from the config and sending. Yeah, it. and that's my problem has been solved for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really important to like. That's why the publication approval process still doesn't have reminder emails, because I would have to just pull all of that out and refactor the whole thing. And I don't work at IGIS anymore, so it's somebody else's problem, which I feel terrible about. But. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing that's really important is making sure that um, users believe that the system is fair and that the system is transparent, which means you can see what's happening. You can, you can tell at any time what's happening and what has happened in the past. And one key element of that is making sure that it's clear at a glance, anywhere where you see a request, what state it's in right now and whose action we're waiting for. And so this, that's an example that we have here at the top. You can see we've got two proposals here, um, both awaiting supervisor approval. And then here in parentheses in the blurred out section, that's somebody's name. It's a real screenshot, so I blurred out the names. Um, but you can also tell that proposal 293, the person that we're waiting for is the currently logged in user because they've got a review proposal button there. Um, and we'll cover that in a little bit more detail in the next slide. But another important element of that is this approval log. And we, we capture that for every request, and that has a record of timestamp, who took the action, what act, impact that action had on the request throughout the entire life cycle of that request. And every re request has that log. Um, and that makes it really easy for somebody to say, okay, you said you approved it yesterday, but there's nothing in the log saying that you approved it, and that's why it hasn't happened. You, you made a mistake. Or, yeah? I'm sorry, my ears are so bad. Do you have approval comments associated with when uh, someone were to approve a state? We do, and that's, uh, that's like three slides from now. <laughs> um, not on this system, but we sometimes have found that we needed that. Um, the last thing to cover on this slide is this timeline interface, which is we found to be a really useful um, kind of UI element if you've got a linear workflow. Because not only does it tell you what has happened before, where you are right now, and what is going to happen from now, it also gives people a really quick understanding of the entire flow and lets people orient themselves with what the entire workflow looks like on the first one of these requests that they encounter. Um, and I found that it made a big difference on how quickly people, or how many questions we got about how the system works. Um, and the next thing I want to talk about is, if you want people to adopt it, you have to make it easy for them to understand and to, to do the right thing. Um, so on every system like this that I build, I put in an actions dashboard. And right after you log in, the first thing you see is a list of every request that you could possibly take action on on the system at this moment. Um, this is a screenshot of one of those action dashboards. You can see we have a project that's awaiting accounting team budget finalization. We have a proposal that's awaiting general and accounting SMO reviews. So clearly this is an accounting team member who's logged in right now. Um, but you also notice that in this proposal, the only actual detail that we have that's related in any, any way to the content, besides maybe the ID number, is the title of the proposal. And that's not enough to do any kind of review. And you, basically, you don't want your reviewers making any kind of decision based on the teaser. So what this review proposal button actually does is take you to the full view where you see the whole content. And that's where the actual action buttons are. Um, 
So this is really just a link, but it's, it's the action that they can take from there. Now this prepare project entry, on the other hand, this is a new project database entry like I talked about earlier, where we need the accounting team to go in and change just a few things in the larger project database form. Four things, actually, because that's what this confirmation checklist is. We found that just putting a checklist at the bottom of the form, the only validation we do on this is that all four checkboxes are checked before you can go to final confirmation. It's just enough to guide people to what it is they're expected to do on the form and to keep track of it themselves, whether it's done or not. A lot of these things are not things that we could validate whether they're done correctly or not anyway. It's an accounting team role. So all we need to do is just give them the guidance to, to know where they need to go and what they need to do. And there's another UI problem that we've run into, and this is a problem that I think exists on any site that uses content moderation, um, and that is this little interface here. So we're, we're taking a look at the publication approval process. We're looking at a publication that's in unit leader review. You can see we have the current state unit leader review. Then we have this change to drop down, which has unit leader review, SMO or peer review, reject, and then you have a save button. And the first thing that happens is a lot of our unit leaders are not that web savvy. And they just miss that there's a drop down. They click save. They miss that there's an error message telling them that they didn't do the right thing and they think they're done. Now that's a user problem and there's not really much you can do about that except that the solution we found to the other problem solves this too. That's why I bring it up. The more insidious problem that exists here is, again, I'm a unit leader. I'm trying to perform unit leader review. So this publication is in unit leader review. I'm trying to do unit leader review. So of course, the thing that I need to select in this dropdown is SMORP review, because that's the next state. But you, you've probably picked up that for a lot of people, the intuitive thing to select here, because they're trying to do unit leader review, they're going to select unit leader review, they're going to click save, and the system is going to cheerfully save the, the publication exactly as it was before, with no error, no indication that they didn't do the right thing, and the only way they find out that they didn't do what they thought they did is when the author comes and says, why have you not approved my publication? So, we found a better way. It's called the Workflow Buttons module. I've recently become a co-maintainer of that module to try and improve it further, and we'll get into that in a minute. This is an example of the Workflow Buttons module on an edit form. I've got a rhythm section now. <laughs> so uh, you, you see, we have the same, the same things in this button. We have unit leader review is, is that one. This one is this one, and we have reject. Um, but the text is not the same. And the reason that the text is not the same is that the labels for these buttons comes from the transition names. And so if you name your transitions after actions that make sense to your users, it's a really easy way to create an intuitive, an intuitive means of guiding your users to do the right thing. And I think you'd agree that it's really clear which of those buttons keeps it in the same state and which ones move it to another state. And the side benefit, there's no drop down in this. So those users who miss the drop down are taken care of too. And then finally on, on this slide, on the view mode, we talked about wanting the users to see the content in its final state to make their decision about whether it's good to go forward or not. If they're not looking at a form, they really have no opportunity to change anything other than the content state, or the moderation state. And so a button that will save it into the same moderation state is pointless. The only thing it does is create another revision on the system of exactly the same content. And so I'm trying to, or I'm working on getting this into workflow buttons so that you don't have to do that. But right now, every time I build one of these, if I'm on the view mode, I alter that form and remove that button that saves it into the same state. And, and now we're on to the, the final interface element, and this is where we talk about comments on approvals. Um, the first time 
needing to gather more information from approvers came up was on the mission request system. When some mission requests started getting rejected. And we learned very quickly that having your mission request rejected with no feedback as to why it was rejected is not a popular way to do it. <laughs> so we needed to find a way to gather that, but we also didn't want to present people with a form. We wanted to just present them with the buttons of the things they want to do unless they're rejecting it. So we looked at what was available. We found the, the dialog box API, which allowed us to set a trigger on the reject button and pop up a modal with this comment box um, to require a, a comment just when they were rejected. And in this particular case, we don't care about the rejection reason as far as the request goes. We don't need to store it anywhere. We just need it to send with the notification. So we gather that here. We include it in the notification, send out the email, and we throw it away. We, we just don't care about that data, so we don't keep it. But there's another case where we just want to uh, allow optional comments as part of the approval process. It wouldn't have to be optional. If you wanted to approve it, you, or to require it, you could do that here. But this little screenshot at the bottom is an example of that. We've got this detail in the green bar. If you click that, it'll pop up and you have a text area. Um, you can see that the unit leader in the previous stage has already left a comment. If the current approver leaves a comment there and hits review complete, there's a look here right below um, the one above it. Are you using yes. uh, comments, cool comments for that? Or? Uh, for this, we just used the text area field and we just um, added it into the... It, we, yeah, we just used the text area and then we populated a, f a field that was hidden on the on the node. So, because uh, <coughs> you something like you threw it away or throw something away, you, the, the person making the request I and mean, it gets you know, declined or whatever with, with comment, it goes back to them and they can still see the comment. They see the comment and then they can resubmit or whatever. They, they get the comment, in, in this case, they just get it in the email. We don't store okay, it, it on doesn't the... Hide to their, their right. it, it doesn't hide it forever. They could make a change to it and resubmit it. But in this particular case, rejection basically meant, like, rejection was the last kind of... If it was rejected, there, you're probably not going to have success resubmitting it because you had an opportunity to go back and change things which we did use the Drupal Commons module for in, in this particular case for that. We asked people to do conversation about requests in progress in Drupal Commons, and then only reject it if it really is unredeemable. So in that, in that case, that's why we didn't need that content. Thanks for that question. I should have added that into the, into the talk, but that's the first time it's come up. The last thing on important things, important things to success, successful approval systems is one that I've missed from the beginning every time until this last system. And that's that at some point, you're gonna to need to prove the value of your system to stakeholders. And if you don't need to do that, you're gonna to need to prove to yourself that some change that you've made has moved things in the right direction, made things more efficient. And that means collecting metrics about things like how long it takes from transition to transition, what's the average time to decision on an approval. Um, it could be any number of things. It's gonna depend on your system. But I didn't plan for that with the mission request system and about two months after we released it, management came and said, we wanna know the average time to decision for the quarter. And so that we can compare it to the previous system and prove that this is more efficient. And so I had to download all of the approval logs, parse that text, and figure out when the thing was submitted and when the decision was made, and convert that into a date that I could do calculations on, come up with an average, average all of those together, and, and could report back. The first time that took me probably three or four hours was faster every time, but it was never less painful. <laughs> so I wish I had planned for it before I built the system. Finally, on this last one we built, I planned for it. We, have, we capture timestamps every time we do a transition, um, and we can easily calculate fields on time between different transitions. 
So we can pretty readily, this is a screenshot from a prototype of their statistics board. That's why the donation time takes an average of three days. It's pretty bad, um, pretty bad average, but that was on the prototype. Um, but yeah, that's, that's gonna make things a lot easier when they have a new request, hopefully it's going to be something covered by what we've <laughs> what we stored there. You can never predict that, but the more you can do to to know what is going to be important and make sure that you have it captured, the better off you're going to be. Um, and most of the stuff in an approval system is not something that you're going to be able to get out of Google Analytics unless you're if you're sending custom events to Google Analytics, you might be able to figure that out, but. Um, it, you won't get it out of the box, so it's important that it gets captured somewhere. And so what should you be thinking about when you're building a system like this? Of course, the most important thing in an approval workflow is the flow. So, the, and the first part of that is what are the logical stages that your request will go through over the life cycle of that request? Um, and then once you know what those states are, then you need to start thinking about the transitions. How do I move between these um, different states? And I don't think I've built a single system like this where I got all of the transitions right the first time. It's, for some reason, it's really hard to think about. But the best way to get as close as you can is to try and think about it from every angle. I'm this class of user. I'm in this state. How did I get here? I, this other class of user, I'm in this state, where can I go from here? Is any class of user going to need to save back into the same state when they're in this state? Um, and then it's also a good time to think about who's, who should be allowed to use each one of those transitions that you, de you define. And whether you're able to identify based on the data you have in the system, who should have that access? An example of where you might, might not, again, the mission request system, the funding managers is really easy. Behind the, behind the scenes, those budgets are just vocabularies, and they have an entity reference user field to reference the fund managers. So grabbing the, fund, the list of fund managers is really easy. We just follow the references to the end and get the fund managers, and we have that list. But the supervisor approval requires us to know I just is organizational hierarchy, so we can determine who any particular staff member's supervisor is. And to get that, we needed to go to I just is HR system, we looked at that, found that the only data interchange format or capability that system had was CSV export. So we built a little importer, and every time staffing at I just changes, the HR person uploads the new CSV file. The organizational hierarchy gets updated in the system, and then we can figure out who the supervisor is. And that was something that we didn't have in the system until we needed it. Um, and so it's, it's important to identify that whether you have that data or not when you're planning through this. And then another important thing to think about is, are all of those actions, or all of those transitions, called the same thing for all the users on your site? An example where they might not be on that newcomer donation network platform. A uh, donation comes in, a site administrator vets that donation to see if it seems like a legitimate donation. If it is, they approve it and it goes into the available state. Then agency users can come in and find one that looks like it would be useful for, for um, the newcomers that they serve and they'll claim it, which puts it in the claim pending state. And then the site administrators again come in and look at that match. And if it seems like a good match, they approve it and it becomes fully claimed. <clears throat> or if it's not a good match, they reject it and it becomes available again. But there's another way that something might go from claimed pending to available. And that's if the agency user decides they don't need it anymore and they want to release it back. But for them, it doesn't make sense to click on a button that says reject claim. So in that case, when it's that user, we alter that button label to say release claim. And so it's just good to identify those cases so that you can make sure that those buttons are always gonna be intuitive 
for the particular user that's looking at it. This is also a good time to think about that case that you mentioned where you might need comments or you might need a reason to, for just a rejection or any number of things you might need to gather when you're not presenting the user with a full form. It's good to plan for that and where you're going to need it and what the trigger for that might be. And then once you've got your list of transitions, those transitions are going to be your trigger points for most of the actions that happen on your system. Um, and so once you've got that list of transitions, you know what are going to be the triggers for your notifications. So that's where you can start planning those. Both your on-screen messages, how, what that text is going to look like to tell them what impact this action had and who was notified. And the off-site notifications, don't forget to tell the requester what happened when something changes on the request. Somehow that's the one I always forget. But that's the user that cares the most about that request. They're the one that put it in, and so they, they really want to know when something happens on it. And somehow, that's the one I always have to go back and add later. Um, and then once you have that list, now you've got a list of email templates to draft. Um, using that admin interface, hopefully, not in your code base. Um, and when you're drafting those, that's the time to think about, is this a notification that I should consider going back and resending a few days from now if they haven't taken any action. And those are going to be your reminders and you should draft those in such a way that you can reuse them and just add a blurb somewhere that says this is a reminder because you haven't taken action. And then beyond the flow, um, we just talked about it so I won't go into too much depth, but statistics. Um, it's good to evaluate what is going to be important to the people who use your site um, and the people who pay for your site and the people who manage your site. So the, those things might be time to approval, time between transitions, percentage approved versus pr percentage rejected, what type of requests are more common. It could be any number of things. It's good to identify what those are so you can make sure you're capturing that data. And then you need to know who's going to use that information and what format they're going to need it in. Are they going to get it off the site themselves or are they going to reach out to a site admin who's going to generate a report for them? Does that, is that content likely to need to be filtered by date or some other axes? Just plan for as much of that as you can so that you can make sure that you have the capabilities in place and either build it from the start or if you build it later, at least you, have, you know what you have you know that you have what you need to build it. And then that point about Drupal comments, it's good to think about here how people should communicate with each other about a request that's in progress. In, in some of these systems, we've asked them to do it in Drupal comments. In some cases, we've said, please do it in email or you know, just take it off-site. Uh, I don't think there's a right answer here. It's going to depend on your users and your system, but it's, it's good to think about. And then, finally, the more legwork you can do up front and make sure you really understand the project that you're building, the less scrambling you're going to have to do at the end. Um, this always reminds me of when I first launched the mission request system and I demoed it to management, the accounting manager said, this is great. What's going to happen in two weeks when the fiscal year changes and all the budgets change? And what happened was I spent the next two weeks frantically integrating the concept of the fiscal year into the system because I, I don't know if I forgot that that was a thing or I I don't know why I didn't do it, but that's why I don't have hair now. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, I would have liked to do that at a more leisurely pace. Um, and then finally, I'd like to go through some useful tools for building systems like these. A lot of them we will have already covered. So for approvals, workflow buttons is, I think, essential for any um, workflow. And that's the link to the project page. State API, that's the link for the documentation there. And then everyone who's done a little bit of development is probably familiar with the form API, but I wasn't familiar with the Ajax dialog boxes API. So there's some documentation there. Um, for communications, 
Here's a link to a documentation page about using the message um, ecosystem of modules. And then I don't think I talked much about how we do the reminders. But basically on a cron job, we go through and crawl our state API to see which ones haven't had action in, in whatever the cadence we set for reminders. And then if we expect to have more than a few emails to go, we batch them up at the Q API. So there's links to the, the cron hook and the Q API. Um, and then finally, this content moderation notifications is the same thing as the message stack for sending emails if your use case is exactly the same as what content moderation provides. In other words, what it does is it allows you to, on any transition to send a templated email to the content author or all users of a role. And so the set, you can set the same kind of permission setup as content moderation provides initially. Um, it provides the same interface with the tokens so setting up those email templates is pretty straightforward. Um, and then finally, these last two projects are con usually considered things that you would use in development. But I find that they can be useful in production for systems like this. Uh, one is mail safety. Uh, mail safety allows you to do any combination of four things with regard to email. You can stop all email from being sent. You can redirect all email to a certain email address or email addresses. You can log all the email into a log, or you can allow email to be sent as normal. So normally, on your local, you're probably capturing email in MailPit or MailHog or something, and so you would let email go out as normal. But then when, once you get to your pre-production environments, you're probably redirecting or capturing it into a log somewhere. And then when you go to production, you're probably disabling mail safety or setting it to send mails as normal. Um, but if you have a site admin who kind of needs to keep an eye on what emails are being sent out and maybe occasionally be able to resend one if somebody claims they didn't get it, um, this is a really quick way to build that dashboard to allow them to see what emails on the system and resend. And then the masquerade module um, you're probably familiar with it. It's a really slick tool to allow you to switch to be a different user without going through the login form and, and all of that, and then be able to switch back to being the privileged user. Of course, you have to have permission to do that. Um, and what that's useful for is doing a rudimentary delegation system. You can, basically your site administrator is the, the user that's enabled to do the masquerading and then the approver lets the site administrator know that they're going to be out of range of the internet and this other user can do approvals on their behalf. And then that delegatee lets the site admin know and they can, they can masquerade and then go do that change for the user. But if you allow people to act as another user and change things in the request system and you can't see what's happening, that's a brilliant way to erode all trust in your system and make sure that no one wants to use it. And so this little snippet at the bottom of the slide is how you can identify that you're masquerading and find the user ID of the original user. And so if you're going to do that, I recommend you use this to then change your approval log messages and your notifications to say, this user took this action on this other user's behalf. So it's crystal clear to everybody what's happening. So I've got some code examples. We won't spend any time looking at them, but they're available in more detail here in this, in this repo. Um, I'll just go through and tell you what's here, and this is just to hopefully provide some value beyond the, the scope of this presentation. This is a service that allows you to easily get the transition ID when you're saving an entity and the moderation state is changing. It's really easy to get the from state and the to state. It's a little bit less straightforward to get the transition ID and sometimes that's more useful when you're trying to logic about what you should do in a, in a case. So this is just a nice little service that does that. I talked about the need to remove workflow buttons when you're on a view and you're saving the same state. 
And I also talked about sometimes needing to change the text of those buttons. That's an example of doing both of those things. This is an example of creating, populating, and sending an email using message. And then finally, this is a partial example of that pop-up modal. What we have at the top of this slide is the trigger on the reject button. And then at the bottom is the little routing YAML. The controller wouldn't fit on a slide, but it is in that repo. And that's all I had. Are there any further questions? Just to the user. So that's where those state API calculations came in. Okay. And we have to kind of customize ac access to those buttons based on whether the user is in that state API addressing. So how did you set up the permission uh, for that supervisor uh, just to make the uh, change the workflow state? Basically, what we do, if I remember right, you can do it a couple different ways. But I think what we do is we give the permission to everyone by role, okay. and then we deny the permission to everyone who's not a, who's not a supervisor okay. um, in, a, in an access. Yeah, yeah so because uh, I had a similar situation like where we had around like 40 languages in the and every language had their own measures. So we ended up creating uh, 40 different roles and assigning them uh, in order Too many roles, uh, and the number of editors on our application were also like very huge. Like we had around like 200 plus uh, editors on the site. I see. Yeah, creating a, a role for every one of just for the recording, creating a role for every one of 50 different languages that you have an editor for can be really tedious. I had a, a similar case where. It was the publication approval process. We wanted to allow unit leaders to have a certain access to something. Um, in that case, I just I created a cron job to dynamically, if that person had to become a unit leader as per the HR information we put in, once a day we'd go through and check and assign a unit leader role to those users. And if they were no longer a unit leader, we'd pull it back. Um, that worked as well, but it really depends on your use case. Anything else? Yeah. What are you using to um, send trigger notifications on the times? Uh, on the time? Is that the module that you did? Or, or? Yeah, it was really simple. For ours, we just send them once a day. Okay. So we just went from, we check if it's been more than this many seconds, well, those are three days in most of the cases, because three days was the right cadence for us. But we just take a timestamp of the last action on that, the, the last change date on that note. Uh, and if it's been more than three days since it was last changed, it, it's time for another notification. There's a gene of those, but it reminds you every day that some email was sent five days ago. Well, that just you need know, you to get on top of your email. Yeah. <laughs>
also kind of calculate values and score those. Yeah. Um, once once something's approved, those things aren't going to change. So then we can just yeah. calculate all those values and score them and, and save time when we need to export those. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Thank you very much.